Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is Friday. Can you believe these things come around very, very quickly? And in our devotion this morning, we are continuing to look at what it means to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I am glad that you are with us. And we're going to have uh, the closing devotion this morning on what is a real Christian? What does a real Christian look like? Uh, we have begun this study by looking at Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. And we have centered most of the week on verses 17 and 18. I want to add a couple of things to that this morning and look at that a little bit closer. So if you will, uh, let's, let's read, let's take a moment uh, to read that passage. And I don't know what I have done wrong, but I tell you what, some of the things that I've... Uh, started to enter into uh, the computer that would come up automatically are not working right. So let me type Romans uh, 6 back in here and go to it first, and we'll pull up those, two, those verses for you to read. So Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were delivered or committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We see the change there. Though you were, that's what you used to be. You became, that's what you have become. And we've been looking at that for the last few days. Today, I want to move further into it. And I want us to look and talk about the change not only is it a change of ownership, not only is it a change in the area of obedience, I want to show you that it's very evident. People all the time say, well, you can't tell if a person is a Christian or not a Christian. And to a very big degree, you, that is true. You look at uh, Matthew chapter 13, and Jesus gave the parable of the wheat and the tares, and we saw that. But there's another passage I want you to see this morning, and I want you to look at verses this morning. Uh, down here at the end, verses 21, 22, and then I want to move to Matthew chapter 20, uh, chapter 7 a little bit later on. Let's look, first of all, verses 21 and 22. Therefore, and you see I've highlighted the words, what benefit were you then drawing from the things which you were, of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Now, now folks, y'all know that uh, most of the time the New American Standard Version is very, very slavish to the Greek language. But this is one of those places that I think the New American Standard messed up. And I want to show you why. If you go to and you look, and I'm going to pull up the New King James as the main thing, but I want you to see how they interpret this passage, and I want to show you something. So what fruit did you have? They translate that word that the New American Standard does benefit. It's translated there in the King James Version and the New King James fruit. What fruit did you have then in the things which you're now ashamed? And then he comes to the end of it, and he says, that you have your fruit to holiness. Now, I want to do a quick little word study here with you because I want you to see why uh, I, I like to use the word fruit here. If you look at the, the word fruit is the uh, word uh, carpon, and we look that up in our Strong's Dictionary, and we see that it is a fruit or produce both of trees and plants on the earth. Now, I wanted you to get that because we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 7 in just a few minutes where Jesus is talking about fruit. So I wanted you to get that. Now, when I lived in Kentucky during my college days, I had moved there. Uh, I had gone to LSU a couple of years, and I moved to Kentucky uh, because I wanted to be with my mom. Uh, she was the best cook, and I wanted to be with them. And I, and I enrolled in the University of Kentucky, and I became friends with uh, a man by the name of Rocky Hall. Rocky Hall did not have a formal education, but was probably one of the smartest men I have ever known in my life. And Rocky became one of my best friends. 
Oh, uh, he we used to go in the woods, we'd go splunking, we'd go all through the things like that. And he taught me so much in those woods and, and there. And one of the things that amazed me about Rocky is that he could identify any tree by the leaf. And if it was wintertime, he could look at the bark of the tree and he would know tr what kind of tree it was. I could barely tell they were trees. And if you were to ask me what kind of tree is this, I would not know. If it would be an oak tree or an elm tree or a spaghetti tree or a peanut tree, I, I wouldn't have any idea what kind of tree it was. But there is one way that I would know what kind of tree it was. If you showed me a tree and it's bearing fruit, say it's a pear, I would tell you, that's a pear tree. Or if it's bearing an orange, that's an orange tree. That's a lemon tree. Because if it had the fruit, I could tell exactly what it was. Now, you've heard me say for years, you can tell what a man believes by the way the man behaves, by how he lives his life. If a man lives with no regard for God in his teaching, he is not one of God's. But before you get too critical of me this morning saying, uh, something like that, uh, let me tell you, if there is no fruit in your life or the life of the one you love, that person, and you know me better than that, that person does not know Jesus. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and hear me loud and clear when I say you can go to church, you can sing loudly, you can profess loudly, you can say all manner of things, but I want to tell you, if, you, if, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, you can tell it by the way you live. You can tell it by your obedience, and you can tell it by your conduct. The change is obvious. You don't have to go around telling everybody, hey, I'm saved. Hey, I'm a Christian. They're going to know it. They're going to see the change. Why? Because he says righteous servants, servants to righteousness, when that happens, there's fruit. The word that is used in the new, uh, in the um, New American Standard Bible is the word sanctified, that the benefit resulting in sanctification. You remember I told you that word sanctification is the word holiness. Now, if you go to the King James Version, guess what word he uses for that very same word? He uses the word holiness. It's right there. Now, before we go to Matthew chapter 7, notice in verse 22, that the fruit of the real believer, the fruit of the Christian, is holiness. Now, that may surprise some of you, because a lot of people would say, well, I thought the fruit of the Spirit was service. Look, you can teach a Sunday school class. I don't care. The question is, are you holy? You say, well, I witnessed to 10 people last week, and three of them were saved. I don't care. Are you holy? You say, but I'm a deacon of the church, and I tithe. That's not the question. Are you holy? You see, you're supposed to be living a life of holiness because that is the fruit of being a child of God. You know, well, preacher, I'm a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter. You could be a false teacher and teach the truth. The question is your fruit. Do you have the fruit of holiness in your life? You say, well, I don't like what you're saying this morning. I don't like that teaching. Well, just let's look and see what Jesus said about it. Go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and look down beginning with verse 16. And I want you to see this. Jesus had been talking about false teachers in verse 15. He said uh, that these false teachers come to you like sheep in wolves' clothing. But let's pick up reading with me beginning in verse 16 because this is absolutely critical. You will know them by their what? Fruits. We just saw that in Romans 6. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and Romans 6 tells us that for a Christian, that fruit is what? Holiness. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Hmm. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? 
And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I knew you once and forgot you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. Wow. Now, if you look back up in verse 17, or excuse me, if you look back up, it says, By their fruit you shall know them, for a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bad fruit. I see a couple of things here. And this is important, especially when we take this passage in conjunction with Romans chapter 6 and those verses beginning in verse 15 in Romans 6. Here are a couple of things that I see that I want you to take away this morning. Number one, a man, in order to be a false teacher, doesn't have to do false teaching. Now understand when I say man, I'm speaking generically men and women. I don't go for that gender neutral stuff, so just follow along. Mankind. If a person... Uh, a person does not have to be, to be a false teacher does not have to do false teaching. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Notice what he said. He said that you would be able to discern false teaching. He didn't say you would be able to discern false teachers. There's a difference. He said, he said you would be able to discern false teachers, not false teaching. There's a difference. Now, a man can teach the truth and be false and lead you astray. I don't know if you realize that or not. A person can teach true doctrine and true, true belief. I have known people who were saved under the teaching of heretics. Listen, it's not the teaching that proves you're a genuine. You could be false and still teach the truth and be a false teacher. Now, how do you tell the difference between false teaching and false teachers and the real thing? Verse what does it say? Verse 17. Uh, no, uh, every, every tree does not bear fruit. How do you know them? He's, he says, by their fruit you shall know them. A good tree brings forth good fruit, a bad tree, and an evil tree, rotten fruit. Jesus did not say, you will know a false teacher by his teaching. And, and when a fellow's teaching is false, you'll know he's false. He didn't say that. Do you know why? Because sometimes it's pretty hard to discern false teaching. I can tell you I've been fooled. I know that that may come as a shock to you, but I have been fooled by some of these guys before. If, if someone just stood up and denied the virgin birth and denied the deity of Christ, we'd know just like that, false teaching, false teaching. We'd put them under the magnifying glass. We would examine everything. But he can, you, you can come into a silver-tongued, eloquent voice speaker, and he just gives a little bit of innuendo, a little, raise a little doubt, and it's hard to tell it's false teaching. So the first thing that we want to get down and be, under, be sure that we understand is that the false teacher is not be, discerned because of his teaching, but because of his fruit. And that's the second thing I want you to notice. A false teacher is recognized by his fruit. Now you say, Pastor, what do you mean by his fruit? There are a lot of people following him. There are a lot of people giving to him. There are a lot of people saying that they're saved under his ministry. I want to tell you something. Even a child, of a, child a little child, can recognize a rotten apple. And Jesus said, if you want to know who is a false teacher, don't look at their teaching. Look at the way they live their life. And that's what Paul was saying in Romans 6. The fruit of the person who has been changed is he's changed into holiness. So here it is. If the fruit of their teaching, the fruit of their life is not holiness, they're false. I don't care what they teach. I mean, if that person ministers to poor and lives in multi-million dollar house and his life is one of debauchery and hedonism. We've all seen those teachers who are popular and live like that. And in my lifetime, I've seen so many of those who got on TV and took advantage of so many people and had multiple jets and lived in luxurious homes. And then I'm not surprised when we said they had, they had a moral failure. They failed in this and that and the other thing. Because you see, the test of the test is, is not the teaching, the test, the fruit, uh, the test is the fruit of holiness. Anybody should be able to recognize that a man who lives an immoral life is false. Jesus said, by their fruits, 
you will know them. Go back and read that a few times. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown on the fire. And Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know what kind of tree it is. So the question is, where are they? The change that comes in a man's life when he is saved is obvious. It's obvious. It's a fruit of holy living. The change is obvious. Now, we live in a day today that is not unlike the day of Isaiah chapter 5. And I know I, I just opened yesterday morning with Isaiah 5. Uh, and I want you to see something there in Isaiah 5 beginning in verse 20. Because I believe this is the, the reason we're having a lot of trouble with people knowing truth and the lie, with people being able to recognize the false prophet that Jesus was talking about there in Matthew chapter 7. And, and the question comes, have you had that change? Here's the problem. We are living in a day where people call evil good and good evil. We're living in a day when they substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. We're living in a day when people substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you don't believe that, just watch the news. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, and they don't believe the word of God, and they're not following the word of God. Clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men and mixing drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are in the right. Folks, if we're not living in that day, good gracious. A couple of weeks we're going to look at first at 2 Thessalonians 2 where it talks about the mystery of lawlessness is everywhere and will be until the man of lawlessness is revealed and, and the, the restrainer is removed. Folks, we are already seeing the fruits. We're already seeing the acts of lawlessness and the spirit of lawlessness all across our land. I expect any day now for that man of lawlessness to be revealed. And so it is absolutely critical and crucial that you answer this question about who is a real Christian. Has there been a change in your life, a change of ownership, a change of obedience? And are you producing fruit? And I don't mean just teaching the truth. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you look back at it, many and will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and perform many miracles? And I'll say to them, I never knew you. What was the true thing? Go right back up to the top. Every good tree bears good fruit. And what did Paul tell us that good fruit was? That good fruit is holiness resulting in sanctification, and that is so critical. Having been set free from sin, you become slaves to God. You have your fruit to holiness, which is holiness. So here it is this morning. Has your life been changed? Has there ever been a change in your life? I'm not asking if you've made a few vows. I'm not asking if you've had a few moments of reformation and said, well, I'm going to make my life different. I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I, and you've done it, and there's never been any real changes that are there. You've, your personality is still the same. Your will still the same. Your emotion still the same. Your intellect still the same. I'm not asking if you've had those kind of experiences. I'm not asking if you intellectually agree with the Bible. You'll remember 1 John 4, 4 says the devil believes and trembles. Here's the question. Have you ever, with your will, chosen to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and submit or surrender your life to him, knowing that he knows best for you and giving your life unto him completely? If you haven't, just respond with obedience and pray, Lord Jesus, I'll pour my life into your mold. I'll pour my life into the form of your gospel. I will allow the Word of God uh, to shape my life. I will allow your will to shape my life. I will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will trust Christ as my Lord and my Savior, as my boss and as my Savior. When you give up all your own efforts and your own goodness, if you pray that way and invite Christ into your life, He will save you. If you don't know for sure you've done that before, you can do it right now. And you can take out that pencil and paper and say, on Friday morning, June the 5th, 2020, 
If I have never received Jesus Christ before as my Lord and Savior, I receive him right now. And I commit to pour myself into the mold that he has, the mold of the gospel. I will obey his word and his will. And if you'll not do that, if, if you will do that, there will be a change in your life, and it will be as obvious as daylight and not, uh, dark. It will be as obvious as death to life. But you've got to surrender in obedience to the will of God. That is essentially what it means to believe. That is essentially what faith is all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time in your word this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless this time and that you will use this time for your kingdom and for your glory. I pray anybody who watches this live stream that your Holy Spirit would be their teacher, not this preacher. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would take these words from your Bible and make application of them to each and every individual heart. And that if anybody who is out there has been depending upon their teaching, their tithing, their attendance, or anything else, and they do not have the fruit of holiness, I pray, Father, that they would receive Christ and begin to have the fruit of holiness in their lives that you would begin to pour them into the mold of your word so that they become more like Jesus each and every day. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see. We had 21 on here this morning. I don't know if there were more at another time. I didn't get a chance to look at it. Uh, Facebook came out with a new setup on this, and I'm not always real good at following it. But let's see who all's on here. John and Gina. Rick, it's good to see you on here. I'm going to change the camera angle there. There we go. Miss Dorothy, glad that you're with us today. Rick Pulsifer. Oh, we're not in a race to see who's first. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for your work at the church Wednesday night. Rachel, good to see you. Hello, sweetheart. Uh, my wife, Mr. Brian Hackett, good morning. Lori, it's good to see you this morning. Miss Diane Musgrove, you're an early riser. I can tell that. You made it even yesterday morning. Good morning, Lisa. We're praying for you. Uh, Cheryl Whitehouse, it's good to see you on here. Miss Betty, glad that you've made it today. Uh, Carol, good to see you as always. Uh, Brian, you taught that no fruit, no root just a couple of weeks ago in James. Good morning, Richard Scheich. Tanya, and uh, I hope that Marvin is still there. Good to see you. Melanie, uh, Melanie, we've missed you. Saw you on here a couple of days ago. Good to see you back. Now, folks, a teaching like this generally generates a lot of questions, and I am more than happy to answer your questions. If you want me to, I'll try to type them out and get them to you. If there are questions that I think everyone would benefit from, if I handle on uh, one of our morning uh, live streams. I would like to have your permission to do it that way. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your questions. If you email me at jpierce at toweringoaks.org, or if you want to private message me, that's fine too, and, and we will look at those. And uh, I thank you. And uh, the more that you interact, the more that you engage, the further out these things go. And listen, this lesson this morning a lot of people need to hear it because they think that just because they go to church, they were baptized, went through a catechism. I had somebody this last week, I sat down with them and I asked them at that, about their salvation. The very first words were, well, I was born into a Methodist home and I was sprinkled and I went through catechism. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm asking about that time when you realize that you were a sinner, you confessed your sin and asked Christ to come into your life. And that is so important because of the church and the theology and so much of the teaching out there today does not give the biblical uh, and full view of salvation. And that is so critical. That is one of the wiles of the devil. And we need to be sure that we get the plain, unadulterated gospel out to people uh, because they're, people just have that natural inclination to think that they've got to work and they've got to do something in order to secure it. Hey, look, I'm preaching again, going a little long this morning. Thank you for your time. Remember that you're in our hearts and you're on our minds and that we love you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.